Hello, everybody. Welcome to MD Insights. I'm Matthew Walsh from the Digestive Disease and Surgery Institute of the Cleveland Clinic. And it's really a pleasure for me today to welcome Dr. John Vargo as we have a discussion around endoscopy and appropriate anesthesia for that. Um, I feel lucky to be able to talk to Dr. Vargo. He's really a very prominent uh, a gastroenterologist who was a recent president of one of our most prominent uh, GI societies, the ASGE. And John, I know you've spent uh, a lot of your career thinking about how to give uh, anesthesia well, how to make patients feel comfortable and safe at the same time. So I just thought it might be helpful to just explain why it's so important that people undergo screening endoscopy especially colonoscopy. Um, and then we'll get into maybe why not everyone gets appropriate screening. So I don't know if you want to talk to that, how important that is. Sure. As, uh, well, Matthew, thank you very much uh, for this uh, invitation. Colon cancer um, is, a, uh, is a health crisis in, our, in the United States. It's one of the leading causes of cancer death. Uh, the advent of colonoscopy and the performance of colonoscopy with the removal of polyps has been shown time and time again to reduce the mortality uh, related to colon cancer death. Uh, I think those, uh, that those facts should really uh, give many uh, pause to realize that this type of intervention in a screening fashion uh, does make a difference and reduces the uh, overall colon cancer mortality in the United States as well as around the world. These findings have been reproduced time and time again, uh, both inside and outside the United States. In addition, there are other conditions that need to be screened. For example, uh, uh, heartburn, uh, chronic heartburn in Barrett's esophagus is another um, condition that uh, merits uh, appropriate screening because, again, that's a precancerous condition and the uh, appropriate uh, diagnosis and treatment of that is, again, uh, will probably be shown to decrease the risk of uh, esophageal cancer mortality. Okay, that's very helpful. Uh, if we talk about colonoscopy, I, I know there may be concerns of patients about the preparation for that test, but Putting that aside for a second, just should should patients be worried about how much discomfort they're going to have during an endoscopy, either an upper or a colonoscopy? Matthew, you know, I, I believe I always, when I have a patient in my office, I, I, I tell them, you know, I want you to be treated like you remember my family. And of course, concern about um, uh, pain and discomfort uh, and the unknown of what's going on are always there. We're at a point now with procedural sedation that in the vast majority of patients that this should be a comfortable uh, experience for them. And we almost, and because of the medications that can be used, rapid recovery following that um, to, to a rapid resumption of normal daily activities frequently the day after uh, should be the realistic goal for them. Okay. And can you give us a sense of what the variety of types of sedation patients could have as part to make their uh, endoscopies more comfortable? Sure. Um, um, the, the, the currency for sedation would be, uh, in, the, in the past has been moderate sedation where a combination of a, of a narcotic medication and a medicine like Valium would be used in concert together to make the patients uh, sleepy and reduce the pain tolerance. They are still awake um, uh, and still can be conversant. We call that moderate sedation. Uh, that's being replaced by the use of propofol, uh, most frequently in the hands of an anesthesia team where, the patient, where patients are actually uh, much, deep, much more deeply sedated. They are asleep. Uh, they are continuously monitored by the anesthesia team and uh, they should not uh, be feeling any type of pain with that. I always look, the other important thing is at the other end of the procedure in the recovery phase. Um, with the moderate sedation, with the narcotic and the Valium-like medication, the, sed the recovery can be, can be hours, perhaps a day, where someone may actually miss work the day after the procedure. 
frequently with the propofol sedation utilized by anesthesiologists, because it's such a rapid acting medication, it also rapidly dissipates from the body and frequently patients are back to uh, normal activity uh, with, within uh, a, a few hours after their procedure. Okay, so if, if patients are awake, so to speak, with uh, moderate sedation, and that includes uh, narcotic medication, should patients have any concern about becoming addicted to an opi opioid as a result of this pr these procedures? Not at all. Um, a one-time exposure is not going to trigger uh, that type of addictive behavior. Uh, Matthew, I've actually had patients very concerned about that patients who may have had someone who had an addiction problem uh, uh, themselves, as well as those who had relatives where they've actually asked me and said, John, is this going to uh, trigger uh, a, a cascade of events that's going to lead to addictive behavior? And there's no data to support that a, a one-time dose of these medications would somehow trigger that addictive behavior. And tell me how you help patients navigate between monitored anesthesia um, versus uh, moderate sedation. How, how do you, what do you recommend and how much should patients participate in this decision about which type of uh, sedation they should get? Yeah, it, it, that's a very good question. Um, you know, it, we've watched an evolution of our practice. Um, you know, there are patients that have had the moderate sedation and done very well with it. So you have the, that group of patients that you know have experienced it, they've done well with it, and there's really no reason to, to change that because they, it's a known quantity to them, they've had a very good outcome, they feel comfortable with that. Um, you also have a group of patients that may have had that in the past and have had an experience where, gee, Dr. Vargo, I, I, I kind of felt a little bit of that or you know, it wasn't as good of an experience for me. And then I think those, those types of patients, uh, you know, offering them uh, the, the, the uh, uh, propofol mediated sedation is, a, is certainly reasonable. We then also have another group of patients that, you know, uh, they, they just have some, they may have me, uh, many medical conditions that make closer monitoring perhaps, perhaps a, a making it a, a safer environment for them to have anesthesia assistance and have that continuity of, 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 of physiologic monitoring. So uh, I, I may steer, I'd probably steer those patients right to uh, propofol mediated sedation at the outset to, to, to ensure that we, we have as much safety around that, uh, that patient in their procedure. Okay. And just to be clear, if, if a procedure starts out as uh, a moderate sedation, can it be converted to propofol or, or how do, if that happens to a patient, what, what, how does that end up? Uh, usually what happens is um, um, it usually, if, if there are going to be cases that can't be done with moderate sedation, most, uh, most of those will, will have to be rescheduled with the anesthesia uh, team at a later date, unfortunately. Yeah. And let's talk a bit about how patients are monitored during procedures. Um, uh, do you feel that uh, they're totally safe? What, how, how should a patient expect to be monitored so they don't get too sleepy, right? Right. So a lot of that depend, depends on the, the targeted level of sedation. With moderate sedation, when they're, they're, they're sleepy but somewhat awake, we utilize a few things. Number one, their blood pressure is uh, their blood pressure is, is checked uh, frequently every two to five minutes. We also put a clip on their finger, uh, and it's called pulse oximetry. It actually measures the amount of oxygen in the blood. Um, the uh, uh, some patients over the age of 55 or those with cardiovascular disease would also have an EKG. The other important part to this is actually the mo the personal observation of the patient by the endoscopist as well as the nursing team throughout the procedure. Those are, that's very important. Now, when you go into deeper levels of sedation, such as you would get with propofol, extra monitoring is needed. And that is because with moderate sedation, there's, ne there's rarely any, any problem with the patient being able to do the normal functions such as breathing and, 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 and cardiovascular function. When you start getting into deeper levels of sedation with propofol, you need uh, enhanced monitoring. And again, uh, those patients not, with, not only have the physiologic monitoring that I've discussed, but they frequently have what we call capnography, which actually measures the carbon dioxide 
being exhaled during the procedure. And we can use that peak with exhalation and inspiration to actually monitor respiratory activity to be sure that the breathing pattern is, is appropriate. So with deeper levels of sedation, there is more intensive monitoring uh, to ensure safety for the patient. So is capnography a more accurate way to actually assess uh, ventilation for patients? Um, our our uh, research, uh, we, we were, I think, the, arguably the first group in the, uh, in, around the world to use capnography. And what we found was that uh, for, uh, pulse oximetry, when you start dropping your oxygen level, it's actually a very late event. Almost all those patients have abnormal respiratory activity, which can be detected by capnography. We did a study, a blinded study, using our, our nurses, and we found out, and, and our docs in the room, and we found that uh, the ability to detect apnea, the absence of breathing, was uh, uh, with visual inspection was poor. Uh, so it, it adds an extra extra level of safety, particularly important with patients undergoing deep sedation or general anesthesia. So is capnography standard now? And if it's not, when do you sort of anticipate that it might be? So it's not standard for moderate sedation. We actually did the only randomized controlled trial looking at this in ambulatory upper endoscopy and colonoscopy to see in healthy patients undergoing moderate sedation, did it make a difference? We didn't find that. Where it really makes a difference is in the deeper levels of sedation where the risks of having those respiratory activity events are much higher. That's where it seems to bear the, the best uh, uh, outcomes for patients. Okay, and I think some people, physicians and patients alike, um, have either experienced or know of uh, opportunities where people can self-medicate. Let's say after an operation, they hit a button in, in, a, in a dose of uh, pain medication, maybe administered to make sure they're comfortable. Is that ever on the horizon for uh, endoscopy? You know, it's interesting. There were studies done. Uh, there's a lot. There's, there's a lot. That's a very complicated issue. We have to um, we have to think about the the pump itself and how it gets feedback. We we certainly don't want to give a patient an infusion device where they can continue pushing it to the point where they may actually go into general anesthesia. The the, the pump needs to have some type of feedback, some type of physiologic feedback with a lockout mechanism to be sure that the patients aren't going to be deeper than intended level of sedation. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a propofol infusion machine on the, um, uh, commercially avail available for about five years, but it's been taken off the market. Uh, there's some, uh, there were some studies done in Europe uh, which showed that it did have advantages, but again, I doubt that we're going to see this type of uh, platform during endoscopy. Uh, because uh, most of the cases are, are going to require uh, deeper levels of sedation. They don't have the feedback, and I think it gets into a safety issue. I think you're, uh, we're not going to see that. It's, I think anesthesia-assisted ass propofol-mediated sedation, or perhaps even uh, nurse-administered propofol sedation under the direction of a gastroenterologist are probably going to be the two uh, major avenues. Okay. So... Can we assure people that propofol is safe? I, I think maybe uh, it wasn't quite the way it wanted to work out for Michael Jackson, but you, you would say that it's a, a, a good and safe drug. Yes, it is. Um, you know, it is, is with any procedure, uh, you need uh, the, the team that's taking care of you ha has to be highly trained and know, and know um, how to use a medication. Any medication that I give can potentially lead, you know, in, in any, in a, in an obviously an increased dose could lead to general anesthesia, including a Valium-like medicine or a narcotic. It's all about knowing the physiology of your patient, uh, dosing appropriately, watching for the, the physiologic responses to that medication, and then titrating it appropriately for that patient. Propofol is a very safe medication. Uh, I think one of its one of its major safety nets, if you will, is that it's it, it, it acts rapidly, but it also dissipates very rapidly also. So that makes it a very nimble medication uh, to, to, to utilize for sedation. So that if someone is going in a little deeper level of sedation, 
the infusion can be uh, decreased or turned off and the patient rapidly goes right back to where the, the, the appropriate level of sedation for their procedure. Do you have any pearls for your fellow gastroenterologist on how to, de to deliver appropriate uh, medication for um, moderate sedation, maybe how to time it with the start of the procedure or drug interactions, anything that you've learned over, I'll say, all these years, Dr. Vargo, that you, uh, you want to share? Um, it's, it's still an art. Um, uh, it, you have to have patience with the, the cadence of the medication. Um, you also have to keep in mind the, the, the physiology of your patient. An octogenarian is, is going, most likely going to take less medication than someone who is younger and fitter. Um, there are clearly patients now that I would not do moderate sedation with. Those that have uh, multiple comorbidities, obstructive sleep apnea. So again, it, you have to tailor the sedation of portfolio to the patient in front of you. Um, moderate sedation works very well. It takes time to get there. Uh, I think the when I see uh, issues with moderate sedation is, is that uh, fre frequently the medications are given rapidly in a staccato fashion rather than waiting two to five minutes to get the medication to the to to the CNS to work. So uh, patience remains a virtue in uh, sedation for gastrointestinal endoscopy. Okay, and lastly, you want to give us a teaser on anything that you see coming down the pike in uh, first um, safety and and sedation and in, in endoscopy. Sure. Um, um, Matthew, we had an oral presentation at Digestive Disease Week, uh, a presidential plenary oral presentation on driving after propofol sedation. One of the things that I've been struck by was, is, is remember, every time somebody gets moderate sedation, they have to come with a driver. So you have two people taking off work that day and, you know, it, you know it, two jobs, uh, children, other responsibilities. And I've been struck by, again, the psychomotoric recovery parameters of propofol. So we did a, a prospective uh, a study looking at patients undergoing propofol-mediated sedation under anesthesia direction. And we used a, a commercially available uh, driving simulator. And we, uh, uh, we did the uh, driving simulator before and at the time the patients reached a traditional uh, discharge criteria by something we call the Aldretti score. And what we found was this, there was essentially no difference. And actually, uh, there was actually learning activity in some of the parameters. The, pa the patients actually did better the second time around. So it's incredibly intriguing, uh, something that we're exploring at this point. Again, clearly exploratory. If you're a healthy person and you um, come and get a propofol-mediated colonoscopy, could you potentially drive yourself home if, if it's an uncomplicated procedure? Uh, something obviously we're, we're, we're very interested in exploring, but it would certainly simplify the approach to endoscopy and could be a potential disruptor in terms of uh, uh, ta uh, taxing on the family and things of this nature, and actually a lot of socioeconomic issues. If you, if you do seven or eight or 10 million colonoscopies a year, you can see the uh, days lost to work. Uh, if you can have that, uh, that may be something that people would be interested in. I think that's very intriguing. Let's not run that on pilots and cockpit simulators. I agree. Keep working on it. Okay. Listen, John, thank you very much. It's been very educational for me, and I'm sure some people will appreciate this on MD Insights today.